Thanks for that. And it's great to be back at Kai again. It's, I haven't been here for about seven years after a hiatus, so... Not working? I'm a bit tall. I'll have to hunch over it. <laughs> um, maybe we can give you the individual mic and then you can hold it at a comfortable height in the spirit of accessibility. Okay. Didn't realise I had an accessibility issue. There you go. <laughs> 20% so, of all adults do. Yeah, that's right. Um, look, most of my research has actually been on sustainability and energy, and this has been a little turn for me going down the road of gender. But gender has become something that is impossible to ignore in the smart home, and hence, here I am. I wanted to begin by acknowledging my co-authors, Jenny Kennedy from the Digital Ethnography Research Centre at RMIT University, Paula Akari and Larissa Nichols, both from the Centre for Urban Research at RMIT University, and Melissa Gregg, who's an engineer at uh, Intel Corporation. So quite a collection and cast on this particular paper. Our research uh, is situated in an ongoing conversation about why uptake of smart home technology has been lower than anticipated and how we can actually bring a number or more of these technologies into our homes to improve our lives for a greater number of households and people. And one of the reasons why uptake has been limited, there are many, but one of them is that the smart home has been in of interest to a particular type of person who is known as a technical guru or someone who is very interested in technology, and that person has been found to be more likely to be a man. The smart home, though, is gendered in a number of different ways. It's gendered by the male-dominated professions that are designing and building smart home technologies and the types of ideas that are actually being generated by that industry about what is useful for the smart home and for people who live in it. It's also by, been gendered by the feminisation of digital home voice assistants, particularly uh, Amazon Alexa and, and Google Home, you'd be aware of. And finally, and of most interest to us in this paper, it's gendered by the people who are interested in smart home technologies, which, as I said, is more likely to be a male technophile or a guru. And you can see a picture here from one of our participants of one of those men and, and his, his setup in his home. Following um, Judith Butler, though, and oh, now this is going to challenge me because I have to... Um, no. OK. Following Judith Butler, techno-feminist scholars and also the techno, sorry, the feminist HCI field, we're interested in understanding how we can broaden out the concept of gender in the smart home, how we can trouble gender stereotypes and design smart home technologies for a great, greater number of people and genders. And we explore these interests in relation to uh, Intel's ambient computing vision for the smart home called the three Ps. And that's categorised as uh, protection, productivity and pleasure. This vision, Intel's vision, is informed uh, by extensive ethnographic research, feedback from its industry stakeholders and also from our research being conducted with them. So I'll just run you through very briefly what these broad categories mean. Protection is broadly defined as the physical and virtual security of the home and householders. It involves technologies such as smart locks and live streams, cameras for monitoring, and various software and hardware protection from hacking. Productivity is about improving the work involved in the running of the household. It involves various multitasking devices, including digital home voice assistants, and also automation and smart home control via apps and voice. And finally, pleasure are the activities that, are, that constitute fun and pleasure in the smart home. They are derived from things like smart mood, mood setted, uh, setting coloured lights, automated or connected water features, home cinemas and a range of entertainment devices that are coming into smart homes. And together the idea is that this, these three Ps encapsulate the bulk of products and functionalities currently available in the smart home market. Our aims with this particular piece of research were to identify how a group of early adopting Australian smart home households understand and experience the three Ps in their everyday lives. But secondly, we were inter interested in identifying gender challenges and opportunities for HCI designers to develop smart home devices for a broader range of potential users, expectations and genders. We adopted a fairly broad term of what a smart home 
meant in this study and we defined it in relation to how our participants defined it. So we asked Australian households who self-identified as living in a smart home or using a smart home device to participate in our research. And they had a range of technologies from robotic vacuum cleaners through to completely system-controlled smart homes. They were mostly aged between 34 and 54. They had high incomes and we had slightly more men than women in this study, even though we actively tried to recruit women, knowing that there was a, a gender bias in this, in this area. And there were a range of reasons why they were bringing these technologies into their homes. Some were just interested in improving things like comfort, cleanliness and security. Others were interested in uh, improving the energy performance of their, house, their houses or they lived with a disability and they were interested in improving uh, their accessibility within the home. So a range of different reasons why they were bringing them in. We conducted a digital ethnography digital ethnographic study, which is a research methodology that provides in-depth insights into how people experience the digital in their everyday lives, but it also involves in-situ research with participants through observations, conversations and reflections. It can also involve digital methods to explore and gather insights about how people use and experience the digital in their homes. We had three methods in this particular study. So we interviewed households, we went to their homes, we had you know, quite extensive conversations about how they were using smart home technologies, what they meant for them, uh, how they were incorporating them into their lives. We conducted technology tours of their homes and observations of how they were using their devices. And we also took photographs, which you're seeing throughout this presentation, unless otherwise marked as being from another source. They're all from our homes, our participant homes. And there are uh, pictures taken of them sort of demonstrating and showing us their devices and how they, they use them in their homes. Our analysis wasn't interested in testing the three-piece framework that I mentioned before, but rather actually trying to define it in relation to these households. So what we did was we transcribed the materials that we collected, we coded them in an inductive, iterative process, we identified themes and what uh, around the three Ps, but defining what they meant based on householders' understandings. And so, yes, really we were interested in understanding householders' experiences and understandings of the three Ps and gender differences around those within the home. Following that, we identified 12 complementary and contrasting case studies to illustrate the three Ps. And these are discussed uh, in more detail in our paper. So there were four case studies for, uh, per P. <laughs> uh, and as I said, they, they provided sort of over, they provided contrasting and complementary perspectives, but they also overlapped. But what we wanted to really do was emphasize uh, a particular theme for each of the households so that we could drill into those in more detail. And those are provided as well as supplementary material to our paper if anyone's interested in kind of delving further into that material. So I'm going to lightly touch on the findings now across each of the P's. In terms of protection, uh, we found that men were uh, primarily concerned about protecting the home from physical and virtual security threats like breaking into the home or hacking into the home. But particularly for men in our study, protection was also under, understood as a form of caregiving for family members. So that might have included monitoring children but also pets in the home. David, for example, that's his laundry in the bottom picture there, and he was um, regularly monitoring his doggy, his dogs. Uh, one of them had got a toy stuck in the doggy door one day, so David had to come home and retrieve that. And that was that was considered, you know, him looking after and taking care of the dogs. And he also monitored his children's homework as well. So we define this in the paper as a form of careful masculinity, which is similar to what Road has called uh, digital chivalry where opening the door sorry where locking or protecting the door is akin to opening it for one's one's partner but we also found forms of careful femininity being explored or expressed in this um, in the smart home as well and that's Kira's um, bathroom there on the right that you can see. She had two children with special needs and she had uh, installed a range of automated technologies in her bathroom to ensure that her children didn't turn on the shower or flood the bathroom without her being aware of that. However, some of the participants in our study also were concerned that these forms of careful or expressions of, of care in the smart home could turn around. They were concerned that partners may use these technologies to start to monitor or control or coerce people within the home without their consent. And while that wasn't happening in this study, they could see that as a very real possibility. And they were concerned that because men were more in control and understanding the technologies in their homes, that that may be something that was directed towards women. 
Productivity was understood mainly in terms of the small conveniences that were provided by automation and voice control, which reduced the mental and physical effort required to do small tasks like opening and closing doors and windows or turning lights on and off. It also was involved in coordinating and uh, various sort of multitasking possibilities in the smart home, enabled by voice control, which freed up hands. And that was particularly important to the women in our study. Uh, for example, Angela, who spoke about you know the, the valuable role of Google Home in her life. However, she was concerned that these kinds of technologies could simply create more time for her to do more work. Productivity, though, could be undermined by what is being termed uh, in other studies digital housekeeping. And we found that the men in our study were particularly uh, the ones responsible for performing this, this extra labour in the home. It's involved in installing, monitoring, setting up, um, maintaining the various smart home technologies in the home, and it was taking an increasingly an increasing amount of time for our participants, sometimes up to 12 hours per week, and potentially taking them away from more traditional domestic chores, like, for example, uh, parenting children or uh, cooking dinner. Pleasure was defined as the new sensory experiences involved in enhancing the home, particularly the natural environment, but also improving the ambiance and the aesthetics of the home. And it was achieved through things like mood lighting, automated water fountains, garden lighting and wildlife cameras. Others spoke about how they were using smart home to trans smart home technology to transform their home into a site of leisure, something that they refer to as the resort or being able to holiday in their own home or, or go on a staycation, where these, these technologies and particularly entertainment technologies like home cinemas uh, and automated kind of pool environments were creating this kind of vacation environment in their, in their own homes. I'm going to move on to now quickly some of the design challenges and opportunities that we identified from this, from this work. So as I mentioned, men were more likely to be the technology guru when it comes to setting up the homes. And at the moment, that was being expressed, as I said, as a form of careful masculinity, as a way of providing care in the smart home through monitoring equipment and devices. But there were also concerns that there are new opportunities here to perform uh, toxic masculinity, so uh, assisting tech-assisted abuse or domestic violence. And while that wasn't found in this study, it is a growing concern in other research. Uh, it's been found in relation to the smart home and in domestic violence situations. So here we're concerned that we need to um, prioritise technologies that reduce this opportunity uh, in the home and, and for this to be much more aware uh, of as part of the design conversation. Our second uh, concern is around expressing femininity, femininity with the smart home. We found that women were less likely to find tech work or digital housekeeping pleasurable or fun. They had a lot less tolerance or, um, yeah, a lot, lot less sort of time that they were, were willing to spend on making sure these technologies work in their homes. So there's a simple message here about needing to make sure smart home is technology is easy to use, accessible for all, and easy to maintain. Uh, of course, that would make it more of interest to women, but of everybody in the smart home, because men would also like it to be more, more easy to use as well. We also had some suggestions in the paper about following um, road suggestion to design technologies that afford technical femininity and other combinations or performances, enable other combinations or performances of gender in the smart home. But we have to be really careful here that we don't just think about designing technology for women and, and universalising women and thinking that women need to catch up to men, but rather provide opportunities to design technologies that afford women different opportunities in their roles as CEOs, as employers, as mothers, as wives, as carers, in all of its diversity and to really Really focus on that as, as, a, as a design um, solution. And finally, our third challenge is around the increasing digital housekeeping we're seeing in, in homes. And really, this is an area where we think much more research is, is needed. It's clear that this is taking up much more time in the home, and particularly men's time, and therefore changing the div gender division of labour and who is responsible for household tasks. It's something that's pretty much completely overlooked in current... Um, uh, statistics around housework in most most countries in the world. So we're not actually even recording this work as housework or considering how it's affected and how it changes the digital, sorry, the, um, the gender division of labour in the home. 
So obviously we need to be developing products that require less digital housekeeping, but we also need to better understand this impact on the gender division of labour and to think about whether this is going to remain a form of leisure, a form of pleasure for men, which we found in our study, or whether it is and should be considered a legitimate form of household work. So in conclusion, greater uptake of smart home technologies involves allowing a more diverse expression and performances of gender in relation to the three Ps. Some of those are already happening, as we demonstrated in this paper, but not because of deliberate design. So we're suggesting that we need to make some of these concerns and these considera considerations a deliberate design focus when thinking about and designing technologies for the smart home. However, we don't think that smart home technologies are necessarily should be considered a, uh, a good solution in all cases. And, and for that, we have a sort of open question about whether in all cases we should actually be bringing smart technologies into our home and they are actually the best solution for a range of problems and issues and, and benefits that we might, we might want to experience in our lives. Just wanted to draw your attention to... Um, some further material here, we've written a report for Intel on this which came out before the Kai report and we also uh, had a media release that came out on this last week. Thank you very much and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We have time for um, two questions. Questions? Um, can you, are you, let's get her a microphone. We don't need to ask if she's able to come to a microphone. Sorry. Hi, I really enjoyed your, your talk. Um, I'm wondering, so you mentioned that um, the task of digital housekeeping takes up an increasing amount of time. Um, to what extent do you think that is due to every device has its own interface, its own language and terminology that it uses to communicate problems? And to what extent might this be addressed by looking at more unified interfaces for uh, troubleshooting and maintenance? And the interesting thing about this research is that we had, you know, such a diverse range of, of technologies and households that were included in the study. So everybody sort of from having a robotic vacuum cleaner through to these system integrated homes. And uh, what I can say about that is that um, there really wasn't an enormous amount of difference in the, the amount of digital housekeeping required. So it seems that in, in, in whatever situation people have in their homes, there still comes a, a certain amount of digital housekeeping. And yes, of course, in those fully system integrated homes where you have control panels and you have, um, you know, you have what is considered, you know, a really sophisticated system, there are still things to do. And they might be, they might be different things uh, to what you would experience if you just had, say, you know, a lighting system on your smartphone or whatever, where maybe it's about updates or, you know, but there is still, um, there is still work involved. I don't know what it's going to take to, um, to reduce that, but certainly, um, yeah, the, you would think the integration of systems would make that easier, but not necessarily. Thank you. Um, we have one last question, and then I think some of us might have a luncheon to go to. Thank you. Oh, oh one more session? Coffee break. <laughs> I'm hungry already. Okay, thank you very much, Yolandi. <laughs> I'm Lenica Kauer from uh, the TU Eindhoven. Um, I, I, I was attending this session, and I've become a bit interested in gender as well, uh, like you are maybe lately. So I'm quite new to this area. So don't don't take this as a critique at all. It's more of an observation. But what I was wondering about is this link between feminine and female and masculine and male. And I was wondering, like I noticed that, that often this link is made sort of in, in, in these presentations still. And I was wondering what the, what the possibilities would be to be more inclusive of feminine males and masculine females in these type of work. Like would it be possible to talk about feminine individuals rather than women or have you thought about that or mm -hmm. is there any discourse around this? Yeah, there is. I mean, it's, it's the language in this area, I'm, I mean, I might, may not be the best person to comment on this either, but I find it really difficult. And one of the things that I became aware of recently is that there's no adjective for um, men and women. 
So um, it's male and female, but male and female represent their, their sexual characteristics, not gender characteristics. So it makes it complicated again. And of course, as you, as you say, masculine, masculinity and femininity can be performed by both genders or all genders. I mean, and then there's, there's the fact that there isn't just men and women. So it's very complicated. And uh, for the, I guess for the purpose of simplicity, I've sort of, and I think other people too maybe um, also have to simplify the way they talk about it. But yes, you're right. I mean, obviously there are, and, and in this study as well, there are, there are different masculinity can be performed by both all genders. So, yeah, it's an important thing to think about. Thank you.